What if you could collect all the water you needed on the roof of your home? Could you eliminate drilling an expensive well? Could you say goodbye to your monthly water bill? You definitely could eliminate the chemicals and additives that are added to most municipal water supplies. We collect almost all of the water we need on our roof, and we live in a very arid climate where we get less than 12 inches of rain a year. And in this video, I'm gonna show you how I incorporated a rain harvesting system into our off-grid self-sustaining home. If you're new here and don't already know, I'm Christina Monroe with more tips and advice to help you create a sustainable home and lifestyle without the typical frustration, overwhelm, and costly mistakes. If you like this video, please click the like button. And if you haven't already, please subscribe by hitting the big subscribe button down below and click the bell. Clicking the bell will make sure that you get notified whenever I upload a new video. So let's get this tour started and head up to the roof. Well, it all starts here up on the roof and your roof design is super important if you're wanting to catch water and snow. Let's start off with the material of the roof. You don't wanna start off collecting water with materials that are going to be toxic, such as shingles or even wooden shakes that have fire retardant in them. Most people choose a metal roof if they're gonna collect water and snow for their household use. So there's a couple of different kinds of metal roofing that you can choose from. And one of the really popular ones is Pro Panel. And the other one that I chose is called Standing Seam Metal Roof. And the reason I chose Standing Seam is because all the seams are covered. And so you don't have exposed fastener holes where water and snow can leak in through your roof. Metal roofing is really designed to shed snow and water. So you really want to make sure that you use the type of roofing that will allow you to have that snow sit on your roof and not leak into your house. Now let's talk about what's underneath the roofing. You really should use an ice and water shield over the entire roof. Now this is where we made a mistake. We were trying to cut costs and so we only put ice and water shield around the openings on the roof, such as around the skylights. And what happens is, is when you get that spring thaw, sometimes that snow melts and it starts to seep in around those areas. And if we had had water shield over the whole roof, I think we wouldn't have the small drips that we can sometimes get in the spring. Now we do come up and we seal everything um, as best we can in the fall, but sometimes there's a little crack and then we get a little bit of a drip in the house. The other important thing you wanna keep in mind is the slope of the roof. Now I designed this roof to slope at a 112 pitch. So what that means is that for every 12 feet of width of the roof, there's a rise of one foot. So that means, so if you have a 24 foot wide roof, it's gonna be two feet higher on one side than the, it is on the other. And you can see this roof does not look like it's steeply pitched. I mean, I can stand up here, you can come up here to shovel snow but with the slick metal roof on, when the snow starts to melt, it slides off the roof and then we lose our spring water supply. So what we had to do is we had to add these little plastic snow guards onto the edge of the roof to keep the snow from sliding off. And that's worked pretty well. But if I had to redesign this roof, I would put a slope on it of maybe a quarter inch per foot of slope, and that would make it more like a roof deck. So where it'll shed the water and it'll shed the snow as it melts, but you wouldn't lose your snow sliding off the roof like you do with a 112 pitch. So once the rain or the snow melts on the roof, it just runs into a very conventional gutter system. And that gutter takes the water to a single pipe that runs through the roof and dumps into the cisterns. And a little later on in this video, I'll show you how we filter and we care for that water before we drink it or wash with it. So the other important thing to keep in mind when you're designing a roof to catch your water is to keep it simple. Keep a single sloped roof. I see these houses all the time that are built with lots of different roof lines. That would be almost impossible to catch your water and it'd be really expensive because you'd need a very elaborate gutter system. Now for gutters, what I used was a seamless gutter that was actually 
formed right here on site and put up. So that means that there's no seams. It's also a little bit bigger gutter so that when you have a lot of rain coming, you don't get that spillage over the end of the gutter and then you don't catch the water. The other thing to keep in mind is keep it simple. What adds to the expense of a nice gutter system is the corners and the downspouts. Now we have a couple of corners and they cost almost as much as the straight run of gutters. So the water lands on the roof, runs into the gutter system, the gutter system delivers it to a pipe that is then run through the roof of the house and then that delivers it into our cisterns. So these cisterns are just concrete septic tanks that we purchased new. They're plumbed together so that when the water fills, then they just equalize. There's a couple of things you want to keep in mind when you're designing your cisterns. And that is you want to make them accessible in case you do have to have some water brought up. Now this does happen to us occasionally. We live in a very arid climate and this year in particular has been very dry. The snow ended early and we had no measurable spring rains and here it is July and we still haven't had any measurable rain. So we did have to have a load of water brought up to get us through until the rains start again. So make it easy for the person bringing the water up to be able to find the cistern and be able to easily bring a hose up to it and, and fill the tank. There's also some pipes installed on the top of the cistern and you can see that there's a standing pipe with a little elbow on top and that is there for the air to escape as the water is filling into the tank. We positioned the tanks so that they would be high enough so that they could gravity feed into the systems room. So that eliminated a pump right there. Now I'm gonna take you into the systems room so you can see how we treat the water before we use it in the household. Then once the water is fed into the systems room, it goes through a particle filter before it even goes through a pump. Then it goes through a small DC pump, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that pump later. And then it's filtered again before the pump it then pushes that water into a pressure tank. And once the water is in that pressure tank, the rest of the system is like any other on-grid house. We have pressurized water that then runs to the bathroom, it runs to the kitchen, and goes to the washing machine. Now I wanna go back up to that DC pump. That DC pump is just simply an RV pump that you would find in any common RV. And it's pretty small, but DC pumps can be a little bit loud. Now I try to use that to my advantage. If I hear that pump kick on and we haven't showered for a while, or we haven't done dishes for a while, then there might be some water left on or there might be a leak somewhere. Also, if I hear that pump kick on a lot, then I know somebody's using a lot of water. The other thing about the DC pump is that if we lose power to our AC system, meaning we have a lot of cloudy days and the inverter kicks off, then we still have running water because the DC is not affected when the um, inverter shuts off due to a low power. The other little thing that I designed into my house is this observation tube. And that's just a simple clear plastic tube in the system before it's pressurized. So that tells me, that's a direct read on how high the water is in the cistern. So at any time, I can just go into the systems room and look at this little um, tubing that we have running up the wall and I know exactly how much water is in our cisterns. So a lot of people ask us how we test our water and how do we know it's safe. Yes, we do on occasion test our water and we have a testing kit that we do from home and then if need be we do add a little bit of chlorine bleach but it takes only a very small amount and it's far less than the amount of chlorine that you would find in municipal water. We also have an additional filter at the sink in order to clean the water for drinking and for cooking. Which brings me to the point of why would you wanna collect your water? Well, there's several reasons for me. And the very first one was, we don't have an opportunity here on this property to drill an effective well. Most of the wells in this area do not produce clean potable water. And drilling a well is very expensive. So by collecting the water on our roof, I eliminated drilling a, an expensive well, and we would probably would have had to haul our water, which is far more expensive. 
The other reason I like catching our water is we can control what's in the water. We don't have to worry about all the chemicals and additives that are added to most municipal water systems. The other reason I like catching our water is it's just one more way to sync with the cycles of the seasons in nature. If we're having a dry spell, we know we need to conserve more. And if it's raining a lot, then we know we have a lot more freedom with our water. But it just makes us more aware and more conscious of what's going on in nature. Don't forget to click the like button down below and leave me a comment and tell me whether you're considering incorporating rainwater harvesting into your new home. And if you'd like to know more about rainwater harvesting and other sustainable features of off-grid homes, then please download my free guide, The Six Essentials of a Sustainable Home. You'll find the link in the description down below this video.